Praise the Lord. David, that was great. Worship team, that was great. Thank you, Minister George. Worship team. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I want to tell you that we're blessed today. We're honored today. We've got royalty in the house. Pastor Jack is sitting right here. We're so glad that you're with us today. Glory to God. It's good to have a man of God in the house with all you other men of God. Praise the Lord. Do you have your Bibles with you? Lift them up and say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. I'll never, never, never doubt this word because it is the Word of God. I've got ears to hear, hard to receive, so teach to me the Word of God. Say, I believe it. I receive it in my life right now in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen and amen. Praise the Lord. We are teaching on the Holy Spirit, and today I want to talk about the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I want to talk about the anointing today. You are anointed with the Holy Spirit. We need more of the Holy Spirit's anointing in our lives. And the church said, Amen and Amen. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Trinity, and the When you're talking about God, you're talking about the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. When you're talking about Jesus, it is easy to visualize what Jesus was like, the incarnate God in the earth. We can picture Him, get a sense of Him, and and in our imaginations, in our heart. And, And again, with the Father, we can have a healthy view of what the Father is like, enthroned in heaven forevermore, all powerful in heaven. But the Holy Spirit is a little different. The Holy Spirit is kind of hard to get a handle on the person of the Holy Spirit. Some say that He is a power that emanates from the Father. Well, He's more than that, and yet He is powerful. He's the third person of the Godhead. Some say He is a force that comes from heaven. Well, He is forceful, that is true, but He is the third person of the Godhead. The Bible uses descriptive terms to reference the Holy Spirit. He is referred to as a mighty rushing wind, and the church said amen. He is referred to as rivers of living water, and the church said amen. He is referred to as fire upon the altar, and the church said amen. He is referred to as a dove descending from heaven, lighting upon Jesus, and the church said amen. But one of the most interesting figures of the Holy Spirit to me in Scripture is the anointing oil. Everybody say the anointing oil. They anointed prophet, priest, and king and consecrated them into their office. And it was a representation. It was a type of the power and the approval and the consecration and the presence of the Holy Spirit coming upon the man of God. And the church said, Amen. Amen. The anointing of the Holy Spirit. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27. And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away. Now we're talking about literally the Assyrians coming against Judah. And the prophet Isaiah says, no, they're going to be defeated because of the anointing. Now watch this. It shall come to pass in that day that his burden, that the Assyrians, will be taken Taken away from your shoulder, his yoke from your neck, and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. We New Testament believers say it this way the anointing lifts the burdens and breaks the yokes. Come on, church. The anointing lifts the burdens and breaks the yokes. Doesn't make any difference what the burden is, it can be lifted. You say, I am burdened in my life. I say it can be lifted off of your life. 
You might be burdened with depression, burdened with oppression, burdened with sickness, burdened with poverty, burdened with family issues, marriage issues, business issues, this issue, that issue, just the circumstances of life. It doesn't make any difference what the burden is. It may feel like a mountain is sitting on your head, but we just sang the song. He is bigger. He is greater. He is stronger than any mountain that the devil can throw at you. The anointing, I said the anointing, come on church, I said the anointing of the Holy Ghost lifts burdens. I don't care what the burden is. It doesn't make any difference what the burden is. My God is bigger. The anointing is stronger. The anointing is more powerful. The anointing, come on, the anointing lifts burdens and breaks yokes. You know what a yoke is? A yoke is something that ties you to something else. The yoke is something that says you get up shoulder to shoulder with this other thing. We're going to yoke you together with them. And wherever they go, you got to go. But the anointing says you don't got to go with them any longer. You're not a slave to that any longer. I'm going to break that yoke off your neck. You're going to be free whom the Son has set free. Jesus said, take my yoke. It's easy. Jesus said, put my yoke on you. I'll do all the pulling. I'll do all the heavy lifting. Come on, church. The anointing of the Holy Spirit is a burden lifting, yoke destroying power of God in your life. Hallelujah. Now, this was to a nation. A nation was being delivered because of the anointing. Don't you think God can deliver you because of the anointing of the Holy Ghost? And everybody said amen. Amen. And amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Christians should be comfortable with and zealous for the things of the Holy Spirit. We should yearn for, desire, be zealous for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. More of the Holy Ghost. Everybody say, more of the Holy Ghost. We should be comfortable with the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. In fact, we should hunger for the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Paul told the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 14 and 1, Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. That word spiritual means supernatural. It means non-carnal, supernatural gifts. We should desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. That's what I'm doing right now. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 12 said, Even so you, since you are zealous, for spiritual gifts. Again, spiritual there means supernatural. They were zealous for spiritual gifts. Let it be for the edification that you seek to, edification of the church that you seek to excel. Go to verse 18, same chapter, 1 Corinthians 14 and 18. I thank my God that I speak with tongues more than you all. So Paul says to the church, he says, you should desire spiritual gifts. Then he says, you are zealous of spiritual gifts. Then he says, I wish y'all spoke in tongues as much as I do. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than y'all do. Then he says, but in the church, I'd rather speak five words from my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in tongues. People get confused about that verse. Listen, in the church, there are manifestations of the Holy Spirit. And when you are worshiping in the Spirit, you will worship in tongues. That's for the church congregation. Come on, say amen. We saw that on the day of Pentecost when 120 believers were all worshiping at the same time in the Spirit because the Bible says that they all spoke with other tongues. They all spoke with other tongues. Everybody say all. They all spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. 
So in the worship experience in the church, we can worship in other languages. We worship in tongues. And everybody said, amen and amen. And then when you pray to God, you can pray in your spirit. This is in church. This is in your prayer closet. It says that we pray to God when we're praying in tongues. But then there is tongues to the church. That needs interpretation. And when we interpret that, that edifies the entire church. So there's the worship experience. Then there's the prayer experience. And then there's the edification of the church experience with tongues and interpretation of tongues. But Paul says, when I'm teaching, I'm going to teach in a language that everybody understands. That's helpful, isn't it? I have not taught a single sentence this morning in tongues. So you all understand what I'm saying. And the church said, praise the Lord for that. We should be comfortable with the things of the Spirit. In fact, we should be zealous for the things of the Spirit. We have to ask ourselves, am I zealous for or am I running from the things of the Spirit? As a pastor, I've heard so very often, Pastor, I, I'm just not comfortable with the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit in the church. I'm not comfortable in that setting. And so, Pastor, I, I just need to go back to my old church. Or I need to go somewhere else. And I say, listen, friend, we should be zealous for the things of the Holy Spirit. We're born of the Spirit. We're filled with the Spirit. Paul said we should walk in the Spirit, live in the Spirit, sing in the Spirit. We have the sword of the Spirit. Yes, we should be zealous for the things of the Spirit. Amen. We should want more of the Spirit. Amen. And let me encourage the men of God in the house. Men of God, let's be men of God. Uh, let's be the strongest spiritual ones in our homes. We should not have to rely on our wives to be the spiritual giant of our home. Come on. We should be the priest of the house. We should be the head of the house. Come on now. We should be the covering of the house. Men of God, we need to rise up and be spiritual giants in our home and in our churches and in society. Church was never designed to be a, a, a women's club. Church, you go from church to church, and, it's, and they're filled with women and a male preacher and a couple of men ushers. But that's not the design of God. That's not the pattern you see in Scripture. When I met Debbie, she was a Pentecostal girl. From her young years, she was a Pentecostal girl. Everybody say, praise the Lord. Praise say, that was good for you, Pastor. But I was raised in a very traditional church. You know my testimony. And I, I didn't know nothing about the Holy Spirit. I met Debbie, went to a Pentecostal church, changed me forever. And I'll tell you why. Because I was not afraid of the things of God. I was hungry. I said I was hungry for the things of God. Now, Debbie knew the Bible better than me. Debbie knew faith better than me. Debbie knew worship better than me. Debbie knew all these things better than me. But I was determined, come on now, that I was going to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ that I was not going to be in the back seat of this relationship wondering what it was all about. Amen. So I got a Bible. Come on, somebody. Amen. I got a Bible, and I went through that Bible, and I went through the New Testament. I went through the book of Acts, and I said, where has this church been all the days of my life? If a Martian came down to earth and read the book of Acts and said, take me to that church. Where would they take that Martian? I say, Martian, come on right here. You're going to find the book of Acts church right here. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
I say let the church be the church. And let the men of God be men of God. Let us rise up and take our place in the church of Jesus Christ. And when the men of God, and I say when the men of God rise up in the body of Christ again and start taking our spiritual responsibilities, this nation will turn around. It's not just for the church. It's for the home. It's not just for the home. It's for the neighborhood. It's not just for the neighborhood. It's for the nation. This nation will turn around when men of God stand up and become who they're supposed to be in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But I've heard too many men say, well, I'm just not comfortable with that. In fact, to the shame, I've seen women on fire get pulled down by men who are not. And I say, that's not right. Men should be encouraging. I speak to young people, and I tell the young people, young ladies, if you meet a, meet a young man, I don't care how fine he is. If he's not a born-again, Bible-believing, Holy Ghost, devil-chasing, water-walking, dead man-raising, man of God, if he's not insisting on the first date that you go to church, if he's not a man of God, then you just tell him to to move on down the road that you don't have time for that nonsense and I tell the young men of God when that pretty little thing oh Jesus <laughs> come on you know what I'm talking about I'm talking about Chantilly lace and a pretty face and a ponytail a hanging down, a wiggle and a walk and a giggle and a talk. Mm, makes the world go round. There ain't nothing in the world like a big-eyed girl that makes me laugh. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. I say, boys, when that big-eyed girl catches your eyes, but she ain't living for Jesus. And she doesn't know anything about the Word of God. She's not interested in the Word of God. She don't want to have anything to do with the things of God. You just tell her to move on down the road because God has someone for you. Hallelujah. He's got a match made in heaven. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now my song was not as good as David's song. <laughs> His song was anointed. Mine was pure flesh. We got to get that thing out of the church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The anointing is essential. The Holy Ghost is essential. We got to have the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost anointing is essential in your life. Say, I just like it the way things are. No, you should be zealous for the things of God. Zealous means that you're going for it. Zealous means you won't be denied. Zealous means you're going to take the mountain. Zealous means that you're single-minded, focused on the things of God. And you're going to the next level. You're determined to win in this life. Zealous for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. The anointing is essential. And that's why when Peter described the ministry of Christ in Acts 10 and 38, he said how God anointed, everybody say anointed, anointed. Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with fire who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. He anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power. Everybody say power. power. Now the anointing is the power in the presence of God. We see it right there in that scripture. He anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. Everybody say power. power. Went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. Presence, the presence of God. The anointing is the power and the presence of of God. The anointing takes you to another level. The anointing is another dimension of living. 
The anointing adds the supernatural dynamic of God in your life. You, you need the supernatural. You can't live in the natural and try to do everything God wants you to do with your life. You need the supernatural. You need the Holy Ghost. You need God's anointing on your life to do everything that God is calling you to do. If Jesus needed the anointing, how much more <laughs> do we need the anointing of the Holy Ghost in our lives? How God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power. That word power is miraculous power. Went about doing good, healing all who are oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Now, look with me in Luke chapter 4, verse 14. Jesus returned. Now, this is the beginning of his great Galilean ministry. He returned in the power of the Spirit, the miraculous power of the Spirit to Galilee. News of him went out throughout all the surrounding region. He taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. Now, one of the stops when he was going in the power of the Spirit, ministering in the power of the Spirit, one of his stops was in Nazareth, his hometown of Nazareth. And it was in that sermon recorded in Nazareth that Jesus attributed his ministry to the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It says in Luke 4 and 16, he came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. As the custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, stood up to read. The custom then was that they would go in, someone would get handed the scroll, they would read from the scroll. Isn't it interesting that the Word was handed to the Word, and then the Word found himself in the Word? Verse 17 there was delivered unto him the book of Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. He found himself in the Word, because he was the Word. <laughs> Praise God. He said, the Spirit of God is upon me because he has anointed me. He's going to attribute his entire ministry to the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Spirit of God, in verse 18 of Luke 4, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to the captive, recovering his sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, and where the amplified tags on, where the free favors of God profusely abound. Now, Debbie and I have claimed that passage for our entire ministry. There's hardly a ministry event that we go to that in the car we do not say, between the two of us, the Spirit of the Lord is upon us because He has anointed us to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent us to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, recovering the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, where the free favors of God profusely abound. Hallelujah. And when we're done praying that, I say, I believe it. She says, I believe it. I say, I receive it. She says, I receive it. Hallelujah. How could I? Isn't that nervy to pray what Jesus prayed and preached? No, it's the same anointing. It's the same anointing that was on Jesus that the resurrected Lord sent back upon his church. Tarry ye in Jerusalem until you are endued with power. The anointing from on high. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. But you shall receive power, Acts 1 and 8, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll do things the way I do it. You'll be witnesses unto me. You will be anointed when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will receive miraculous power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, then you will be able to do it the way I did it. Then you'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world. How does the anointing work? The anointing is the power and the presence of God upon the believer. How does that work? 
I want to walk in the anointing. How about you? I want to live in the anointing. How about you? We need the anointing. We need miraculous power in our lives. Acts 6 and 1. They had a little trouble in the church, and the apostles said, select deacons, settle the trouble, take care of the administration of the, the food to those in need. And so they selected seven men. Seek out among you, Acts 6 and 3, seek out among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. We'll give ourselves continually to prayer, to the ministry of the Word, the, ple the same pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. The anointing requires faith. The anointing expects faith from the believer that he is anointing. Faith is essential to operating in the miraculous power of God. The anointing comes upon the believer, but if the believer is in denial of the anointing, if the believer is not looking for the anointing, if the believer is not zealous for the anointing or desiring the anointing, if the believer just says, I like my tradition, I like my ritual, I like my ceremonialism, I like it just comfortable. I'm not looking to go to the next level. I'm not looking. Listen, Jesus did not die to make us comfortable. Jesus died to make us victorious. That's why he gave us the anointing of the Holy Ghost. There's nothing in this Christian life that is designed to make us comfortable. He said you're going to have to pull on the whole armor of God. You got to pick up that shield of faith. You got to pull out that sword of the Spirit. Come on, church. You got to get ready for a life of warfare if you want to win in this life, if you want to be an overcomer in this life. You need the anointing, but it's going to take faith. 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 To operate in that anointing. Stephen, verse 8, Acts 6 and 8. Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. Full of faith. Everybody say, full of, faith. full of faith. You want to be full of power? Get full of faith. The great signs and the wonders came after the full of faith and the power. Full of faith, full of power. Then came the great wonders and the great signs among the people. You see, faith is the access, access point. Faith is what takes you in to the grace of God, into the anointing, into the power, into the supernatural. Faith is the key that unlocks the door. Faith is required on behalf of the believer to access everything that Jesus died to give to us. But sadly, not everybody is operating in faith. You know, the people that heard that sermon from Christ, they heard Jesus say, the Spirit of God is upon me, for He has anointed me too. And then he went through all of his ministry assignment to preach the gospel to the poor, to preach deliverance to the captive, recovering his sight to the blind, set at liberty them that are bruised. He went through the whole ministry agenda that was before him, and the people heard him. And then Jesus sat down and said, today this prophecy is fulfilled in your hearing. He said, I'm the man. And you know what they said? No, you're not. You're Joseph's son. We know your brothers. We know your sisters. You grew up here. We know you. That's not you. Matthew 13 and 55. Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? Verse 57, and they were offended at him. 
But Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, in his own house. Now the next verse may be one of the saddest in the New Testament. Now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Their unbelief. They couldn't receive from him. They just could not receive it. They could not receive his word. And therefore, they did not receive his blessing. They did not honor him. They were full of unbelief. You see, it's faith that connects you to the anointing. It's honor that connects you. You cannot receive anything from anybody you do not honor, that you do not respect. If you have no honor for them, for them you do not hear what they're saying. Not a word. In fact, you will get offended at them. They did not honor him. They did not believe him. I'm interested in a verse in Luke chapter 5, verse 17. It says, Jesus was teaching. Pharisees, teachers of the law, were sitting by. They've come from every place out of Galilee, Judea, Jerusalem. There were crowds following the Lord. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. You know, the power of God is always present. God is omnipresent, especially in you. He lives in you. The power of God is always present. It doesn't mean that we always avail ourselves to the power of God. It's always present. It's always available. Doesn't mean we always avail ourselves to it. You know that we put up the awning in the, in the room that we're converting into Cafe Rico, the Friendship Center. And uh, Jack did such a brilliant job manufacturing that. Isn't it gorgeous? It's a work of art. I just love it. I just love it. He went above and beyond. He put all sorts of lights in it and, and thing. it's just amazing. And so when you look underneath it, there's all the, the wires and the lights. And, and, and what it needed to be was to be plugged in. And, and Jack said, no problem. There's plenty of power in that wall. In that wall. In the wall was an endless source of power, wires, lots of wires, but they're in the wall. I had no idea how to get to them, no idea what to do with them if I did get to them. But the power was there. The power was there. But I had no access to it. Y'all following me now? I'm making an illustration. Fortunately, Elder Sonny was on hand. Elder Sonny said, uh, where would you like the light switch? I said, in the wall. He said, I know, but how high? Where about? So before you know it, he and Jack are opening up a hole in the wall, pulling wires out of the wall, knowing how to hook those wires up so that the power that is already in there, already exists in there, serves the purposes for what we need it to do. And he put a light switch in that thing, pulled wires out, ran wires up to the thing that we wanted to light up, hooked it all up, put it back in, connected a switch, so now I can, I can know, I know nothing about wiring, but now I can go flip a switch, turn that thing on, and say, praise the Lord. Look at that. The power is there. I said, the power of God is there. What do you need? You need the healing. The power is there. You need the blessing. The power is there. You need the restoration. The power is there. You need the burden lifted. The power is there. You need the yoke destroyed. The power is there. The power is present to do whatever you need it to do. You need access to it. Faith. Faith. Everybody say faith. faith. Hallelujah. Faith. Hallelujah. 
Praise the Lord. Now, interestingly, in Luke chapter 6, y'all getting anything out of this today? I'm going to finish on this. Interesting, in Luke chapter 6, verse 17, it says, He came down with them, stood on a level place, the crowd of His disciples, great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, came to hear Him and to be healed of their diseases. To hear Him. Faith comes by hearing. They came to hear Him. Some came just to be healed. Others came to hear and to be healed. Some people don't want to hear it. They just want it. They just heal me and let me go. I got to get to the mall. Let me get on my way. I got things to do. But they got no faith for it. Therefore, they don't get it. They don't keep it. They don't live in it because they don't have faith for it. But they came to hear him to have faith stirred in their being. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, hearing and accepting. Mark 4 and 20, accepting. That's my Word. I believe that. I receive that. Then meditating on it, growing it out of the abundance of the mouth, uh, of the heart, the mouth speaks. Then releasing that faith, then the works that confirm the faith, they heard it, and, they, and to be healed, as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits, they were healed, verse 19, and the whole multitude sought to touch him, for power went out from him and healed them all. Kenneth Hagin says the healing power of God is a tangible substance. Now, there are times when the word was just spoken. The centurion's servant was healed by the spoken word. There's plenty of times where Jesus was not in proximity to the, to the miracle at hand, but he spoke the word. He took authority over distance, and he spoke the word, and healing was manifest. Amen. Praise God. Amen. But there are times that when people sought to touch him to get hold of the hem of his garment because that was a demonstration of their faith. The woman with the issue said to herself, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. The healing touch. Everybody say the healing touch. Another instance, the same thing happened in Mark 14. You don't have to turn there. But all who were sick, they begged him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched it were made perfectly well. Over and over again, Jesus would say, your faith has made you whole. Praise the Lord to touch this is a miraculous thing. This is a glorious thing. You read about the claws of, of the Apostle Paul when, when he would wipe his head and people were healed. Or the, the shadow of the Apostle falling upon somebody and they were healed. The touch, the miraculous touch. Let me close with one touch that changed a dead man's life. 2 Kings in 13, verse 20. And Elisha died, and they buried him. And the raiding bands from Moab invaded the land in the spring of that year. And so it was, verse 21, as they were burying a man, that suddenly they spied a band of raiders, and they put the man in the tomb of Elisha. Now remember, Elisha got that double portion. Everybody say the double portion of the anointing. They put him in Elisha's tomb, and when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha. Now, Elisha had been in there so long that the only thing that remained was his bones and the anointing. They lowered the man in, and when he touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and he stood on his feet. It seems to me that if the anointing is in the 
bones of a dead prophet, the anointing should be in the living bones of a living prophet that revives all who comes in faith to receive their touch of God. Everybody say amen. Everybody say amen. The anointing of the Holy Ghost lifts burdens and breaks yokes. Do you feel like you have a burden in your life? you feel like you have a yoke in your life? Maybe you're believing God for that healing. Maybe you're believing God for prosperity. Maybe you're believing God for peace that passes all understanding. Maybe you're believing God for a healing in your home, healing in your marriage, a prodigal child to come back home, a, a, a grandchild to find Jesus as Lord and Savior. Maybe you're believing God for increase in one area of your life or another area of your life. The anointing lifts burdens and breaks yokes. Touch the anointing and change your life. Touch the power of God and change your life. Did you get anything out of this today? This is what we're going to do. I'm going to invite all to come down that are seeking and desiring for the burden to be lifted and the yoke to be destroyed. Whether it's healing, whether it's finances, whether it's home life, business life, I'm not going to get into any of that. But what I'm going to do is to anoint you with oil because the oil represents the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. And when you are anointed with oil, I want you to be as the man that touched Elisha's bones. I want you to come alive in your faith, come alive in your spirit. And you just said, that's my blessing. God just lifted the burden. God just broke the yoke. My life has changed right then. Faith, faith, faith is the access. Faith, faith, faith is what makes it happen. So if you need the touch of God, if you need the burden lifted, the yoke destroyed. When I count to three, I'm going to ask everybody to stand. I don't want anybody to leave at this point. we got a few minutes left in service, but I will ask you to stand. And if you need prayer, I want you to come on down to this altar area. The ushers will help you to get into the right place. Everybody else, pray for us. Pray for us in the power of the Spirit. And let's receive our blessing. Hallelujah. Pastor Jose, come on up, join me. Debbie, come on up, join me. Pastor Whiney, come on up and join me up here. Oh, Riyalamasiri Alamasa. Yeah, burden lifting, yoke destroying, power of God. Where's my oil? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, this is what we're going to do because there's, there's so many of us here. I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Jose to start at that end. And, and what we're going to do is we're going to anoint you with oil and we're simply going to say the power of God is upon your life. Simply, and you receive that by faith now. And as soon as we say that, that is your moment in time where you're believing God, the burden just lifted. The yoke just destroyed. This battle is won in Jesus' name. Come on. You with me now? All right. Pastor Jose, you start down there, start praying. Where's Pastor Whiny? Are you with me, Pastor Whiny? Praise the Lord. Somebody get Pastor Whiny. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Healing is here. Yes. Healing is here. My eyes. 
look to you, my rock, my healer. I trust in you. Sickness, sickness can't stay. Sickness can't stay any longer. Your perfect love is casting out fear.
presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. Oh, I'm deserve the glory. And the honor, we lift our hands in worship as we lift your holy name. You deserve the glory. Give me one minute, George. There's still some that you're hesitating. Healing is here. Don't waste. Don't waste this moment. You need healing in your thought life. You need healing in your body, in your bones, top of your head to the soles of your feet. You need some yokes destroyed in your family. Come, don't delay. For you are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like in you. Come on, church. There is no one else like you. Like you. You are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. There is no.
praise you, Jesus. Hasn't God been good? The mighty anointing of the Holy Spirit is the game changer. And your faith is the access to it. The anointing is the power in the presence of God. Don't you want more of that? I want more power. I want more presence. I want to be zealous for the things of God. Zealous people are not denied. Zealous people are determined to receive. Zealous people will not give up short. No, there's another level to live on. There's a higher height to go to. There's a deeper experience with the Holy Spirit to be had. More of the Holy Ghost. More of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 closing point if there are any here or any watching online that have not given your heart to Jesus Christ to make him your personal Lord and Savior this is your chance this is your moment you stand at the threshold of eternity don't turn away don't say I'll do it later no this is it if you need to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, go ahead and raise your hand at this time. I won't embarrass you, but I will pray with you to receive Jesus. So go ahead and raise your hand to say, yes, I need Jesus in my life. I need to be born again. Quickly, quickly. Okay, we're all heaven bound? We're all going to heaven? Okay. I love that. Praise the Lord. Online. If you need to receive Jesus, Pray this prayer with me right now. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I confess there has been sin in my life. Forgive me. Cleanse me with the blood of Jesus. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. I believe Jesus Christ died for my sins. I believe he is the resurrected Lord, enthroned in heaven forevermore. Right now, I receive Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. I say amen and amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, you're a born-again believer. Let us know so we can get some materials to you. Well, God bless everybody. I say the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you. See you Wednesday night.